Well, I have to be honest with you today that someone sent me a letter this week that kind of hurt my feelings. And uh, normally I don't get my feelings hurt, but this time I did. And um, I'd already been um, kind of struggling with something all along. And then for someone to send me a letter like this really kind of sent me over the edge. It's this one. It says, Mr. Powers, welcome to AARP. <laughs> hurt my feelings. Um, this month, January, I turned 50 later in the month. And so, uh, yeah, the big 5 I heard some ooves there. So this really hurt my feelings. Welcome to AARP. And you know, if I sign up now, I get this free travel bag, <laughs> which is really great. So when I go to Honduras this year, I can carry that AARP travel bag. It's pretty impressive. Oh, my. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. We're going to study today the Gospel of John. And uh, I've been thinking about this quite a while. How, how are we going to follow up on our great year of reading through the Bible? It's been such a great study, good for me. And so I thought it would be good for us maybe to spend some time in one of the Gospels. And I chose the Gospel of John. Not because it's one of the easiest because really it's one of the most difficult. There are some very difficult teaching passages of Jesus found in the book of John, but we're going to attack all of them in the best that we can. So we're going to divide the lesson up into two parts. I want to spend a little time at the beginning of the lesson just considering the man John and how that this unique perspective that John's going to give us is going to be such a blessing to give us a more maybe intimate look at Jesus or a different look. As you know, John does not fit in with the other three synoptic gospels in that it's, it's a little different perspective, covers a little different material, but all, of course, studies the same Messiah or man, Jesus. And then we will spend the last part of the book looking at the first part of the first chapter, particularly under this idea, he who has seen Jesus has seen the Father. This is really important because John's going to emphasize this a lot in his teachings. And uh, whenever the disciples will ask him, well, show us the Father. And Jesus, in almost an exasperated kind of tone, is going to say, how can you keep asking me to show you the Father? I've told you, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And this is great news for us, because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to study. And the more we know and understand who Jesus is, as revealed in the Scriptures, the more we understand who God is the more we understand who the Father is, His nature, His purpose, His desires for us, because Jesus is God in the flesh. And so as we study and, and look at the life of Jesus, we'll know more about God, and that's great news for us. So let's consider first John the Apostle. In John chapter 19, in this beautiful scene at the cross, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. This gives us then a glimpse at the kind of relationship we're going to find between John and Jesus. It's an intimate relationship. It's a close one. Imagine if something like this were to happen to you and you felt a, a, a sense of responsibility and the care for your mother as the oldest child. And you were, you were there and you know that time has ended and Jesus here as he's on the cross and he gives care to his mother, a, a precious person in his life, his own mom. He gives care of his mother into the hands of this man, John, who refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus, whom Jesus loved. So this intimate scene at the cross, it really reveals to us the kind of closeness and intimacy that John had with Jesus. A comparison of the four Gospels reveals to us that Salome, you have to do a little reading between the lines, but you can see it's, it's pretty obvious there if you will look, look and see. But a comparison of the four Gospels reveals that Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of James and, and John. 
Um, it is therefore, when we put this together, we find then that John is then related to, to Jesus. He is his cousin, his first cousin. The Bible's first introduction of John hints to us the reason that we would pay such a vital, he would play such a vital part in the ministry of Jesus. Of the twelve, he writes more scripture than any of the others. Of course, it helped that he lived the longest. But uh, he writes to us, and we have recordings of John, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then we also have the book of Revelation that was written by the um, Apostle John. If you'll turn to John chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 29. Verse 29, this is where we're going to find our introduction to John. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's John the Baptist who said that. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, notice this carefully. John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said, Who do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which being translated means teacher, Where are you staying? And he said, Come and you will see. They came therefore and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which being translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which being translated means Peter. So we we find here then that one of the disciples of John the Baptist was uh, John and also Andrew. The first of John's disciples then, of John the Baptist, reveals John then as a seeker, a man who was spiritually prepared for the Messiah. As a follower of John the Baptist, uh, he was already a man who was interested in spiritual things. He was a man who had listened to the teachings of John the Baptist about Jesus. And therefore, uh, he was ready for the coming of the Messiah. The intimacy that John had with Jesus, not only as a cousin, but also in the inner circle. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, gives us a unique and intimate perspective in which to view Jesus. Now, we're going to look at some of these more tonight, but I just wanted to give you an idea. It's always been a little intriguing, and maybe we can develop this idea throughout our study. But you think about how uh, Jesus chose three men from among the twelve to be his inner group. I've often thought to myself that surely would have created a certain amount of jealousy, it seems, among the twelve to have three that were kind of Jesus' special three that he took from the among the others, and spent time with them. And maybe we'll explore that along the way as we study. But I, I wanted you to consider there are at least three times given in Scripture here at the Transfiguration and when the dead girl was raised and at Gethsemane where uh, these three, Peter, James, and John, are, are pulled aside as an inner circle, uh, an inner grouping of people that Jesus spent more intimate time with. In this Mark 14 passage, it says, And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. 
And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. So we should be excited then about having John's gospel because we find not only one of the twelve, a relative of Jesus, a follower of John the Baptist, who now follows Jesus, but also part of this intimate group, this inner circle, one who had close companionship with, um, with Jesus. We also find uh, that John refers to himself on many occasions as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I like this as well because it appears that John wants to remain in a certain amount of kind of uh, anonymity. Uh, and so he just refers to himself simply as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that it, it was John. And so we find in these occasions, at the Last Supper, the cross, running to the tomb, post-resurrection, uh, we find John referring to himself on these occasions as the disciple whom Jesus loves. Let's just look at one of those, the John 13 example, if you'll turn there with me. John chapter 13. I want you to notice when we read this, the closeness in proximity that John has with Jesus at this occasion, at the Last Supper, um, and the way that they interact, and you can see the closeness between the two of them. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breasts one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore gest gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who he is speaking of. And he leaning back thus on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Jesus therefore, therefore said, what you do, do quickly. Now one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose that he had said this to him. For, some, uh, for no one knew why he would said this. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying, buy the things we have need for for the feast, or else that he should give him something for the poor. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. So I refer to this only because I wanted you to see that there was a, a closeness in proximity between Jesus and John on this, on this occasion. You see the interaction between them, the the whispering, the interaction, uh, I intimacy that's revealed there. The NIV says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. So there was a closeness between them. It's not surprising then, because John refers to himself as the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved, that his, his message, his book, would have a lot of writings on love. And as you read the book of John, and also as you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you find a great emphasis on love given there. Here's an example of some of those. And again, we may look at some of these again tonight. In John chapter 5, God is love. John 10, 15, and 17, God loved his son. God's love for the disciples. God loves all men. God is loved by Christ. Christ's love for the disciples. Uh, in John chapter 13, the washing of the disciples' feet. Um, Christ's love for individuals in John 11 and, verse, and chapter 13. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Christ expected all men to love him and the Father, and we should love one another in John 13. So uh, time and time again we find love, love, love emphasized in the writings of John. In fact, in verse 34 and 35 of John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's good for us then to understand what love is. It doesn't take us long to look through uh, modern definitions of love to know that they are 
that, that they pale in comparison to the kind of love that God defines for us in the Bible. And that by this kind of love, this agape love, this for others love, we are known to be the disciples of Jesus. Now, it's interesting because you get this, uh, this picture of a very kind and gentle man who, who speaks about love a lot and is close and intimate with Jesus. However, there's another side that isn't given too much emphasis in Scripture, but it's another side of John that we do see. So he seems to be a blend of both a gentle humility, but also of a bold passion. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 17, we find that Jesus had a nickname for James and John, which means sons of thunder. And an example of this bold passion is found in Luke chapter 9. I have it for you, and you can read along. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. So maybe a little different look at their personality. They say, yeah, he was a kind and gentle man and emphasized love, but he wasn't a pushover. Uh, you certainly find on this occasion that they were sons of thunder, that they got riled up, and they uh, were going to, uh, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven? It kind of reminds me, in a way, of the, the great blend of personality that you find in David, as an example. David was a rugged warrior, a man of blood, a man who was denied by God the privilege of building the temple because of his he was such a man of blood and a man of war. But yet you read in the scriptures, in Psalms, his tenderness and his passion and intimacy with God. And it's a, it's a wonderful blend. You kind of get that same feeling or spirit perhaps here mentioned in John the Apostle. So there then is a little uh, uh, look then at the Apostle, the man, John. Now, let's consider the second point in this lesson from John chapter 1. But I want you to turn to John 17 first. John chapter 17. Let's read the first four verses. And I have this again in a later slide, but I want to I include it here. John 17. These things Jesus spoke and lifting up his eyes to heaven said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Even as thou gavest him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. Now look at verse 3. This is really important. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. Notice in these words that eternal life is to know God. And the greatest way, one of the, the best ways for us to know God, to have a relationship with the Father, is to know the Son. And so as we look and it, the more we study the Gospels and we consume the information about Jesus, about how he responded to rejection, about how he felt toward the poor, about how he preached the word, about his obedience to the Father, about his compassion for mankind, and on and on and on as we read about the life of Jesus, we know God the Father more intimately and we get to know him more. And so it's a worthwhile study for sure. Now turn to the first chapter and let's read the first 18 verses. John chapter 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness that we might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness to the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, but by the will of man, or but not by the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, uh, punch up that verse, verse 18. I really like this verse. It's one of those verses I really hadn't spent a lot of time on or thought about much until preparing for this lesson. But it really emphasizes this whole culmination of the first chapter, which is Jesus is going to be God's presence in the flesh among men. And the marvel and the wonder of that concept, to think that God would send himself or his son to come and to be upon the earth God in the flesh among us and so then sort of at the end of this whole thought process John says no one has seen God but you have seen Jesus this one who is in the bosom of the father and he has explained him to us he's explained who God is it's such a it's such a great verse So good I had to read it in other versions. So here we have the NIV. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Great words. The Phillips translation. It is true that no one has ever seen God at any time, yet the divine and only Son who lives in closest intimacy with the Father has made him known. Another great one. The ESV says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Such a beautiful concept in illustrating this main point that I'm wanting to to iron out that is part of John's message. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. and It's a wonder. It's a marvel. It's precious to us. Some of the oldest uh, translations and authorities read here, the only begotten God which is in the bosom of the Father, in intimacy with Him, in closeness with Him. Jesus, He has revealed who God is. He has revealed God to us. In Matthew 1, 22 and 23, in case we missed the point from John, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. That's who Jesus is. God among us. God in the flesh. God with us. John 1, verse 14, we read a moment ago, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the book actually begins with these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In 1 John chapter 1, 1-4, which we studied last week, I believe it was, 
What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This illustrates to us and shows us then that John was a, a great a person to be able to reveal to us this man Jesus because of his intimacy with him, because of his closeness and relationship to him, but he had seen Jesus in the flesh, touched him, been with him, seen and heard him. We proclaim him to you that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Good stuff. So because God became a man, he is able to understand the human experience, and to help us in our time of need. Have you ever thought, how would God handle rejection? Well, look to see how Jesus handled rejection and you would know, because he is God. How would God respond to the poor? How would God respond to the lost? How would God respond in all the 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 circumstances of life that life brings to us. When we look at Jesus and we see how Jesus responded to all that life brought, then we can understand how God responds to those things because He and the Father are one. He's able to help us then in our time of need because He has fully lived the human experience. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, because He Himself suffered when He was tempted... He is able to help those who are being tempted. Does God know what it feels like to be tempted? He does in that Jesus was tempted and knows and is able to help us then who are being tempted. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God has been a man that is in Jesus Christ, in flesh, and understands and knows what it is like to be a man. And then we studied this in last week's lesson from 1 John 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He himself is the propitiation of our sins, not only for ours, but for those of the whole world. He is an advocate because he understands, because he can help, because he has been flesh and blood as as we are. Now let's continue and look at this passage in John chapter 14. This is one I alluded to earlier. Philip then said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, I've been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, God, after after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he has made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Notice the words I have here in gold. Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. So when we see Jesus, we see God and we know him. I know we're just pounding the same point over and over, but I want you to see what an important message it is, not only in John, but throughout Scripture. And then as we read earlier, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, even to all whom you have given him. 
he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, that the glory which I had with you before the world was. I hope that I have excited you in, the, in this possibility of studying the book of John. I want to end with two Colossians passages, which are great as well. The first is Colossians 1, 18 and 19. Speaking of Jesus, He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was God's or the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now soak that in for a moment. The New American Standard Bible says, For all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The NIV says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is, by the way, not a bad translation at all, for the entire, and it's my favorite for this verse, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Now, if you haven't been convinced by the writings of John, certainly by this one of Paul, you should be convinced. The more we know Jesus, the more we'll have a relationship with God and to know him. So it is our desire then through this study to study the book of John and in that way, we'll know more about who God is. A study of the life of Jesus then will reveal the Father to us. The more we know Jesus, the more we know the Father. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, as we embark on this study of the book of John, we are thankful, Lord, that you have provided this intimate look at the life of Jesus, our Savior, whom we desire to know and to understand and to learn about his life and to see his nature and to understand, Lord, and to, to try to grasp the thought that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, and he dwelt upon this earth as a man and it's our desire, Lord, as we study from the book of John to grow in our understanding of Jesus, knowing that the more that we know him, the more that we will know you. And it's our desire to know you and to love you more deeply and to obey you more. So we thank you, Lord, for this great word of Scripture, this book of John that you have given to us. That We may read it, study it, and obey it, and learn. We may know you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, Happy New Year to everybody. I hope that you're making commitments this year to continue in Bible reading and that uh, maybe you'll start in the book of John. It'd be a good place for you to study if you're looking for something new to read. If you'd like to respond this morning to come to confess sin of any kind or to say, I need some help, we enjoy having the prayers of, of the church, or to make your confession this new year do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins? We'd like to assist you with that. If that's in your heart today, will you come as we stand and sing?